Well, I can tell you one thing, it's hotter up here than it is down there. <laughs> so, but I'm gonna keep my coat on until after this lesson, but for the class, I'll take my coat off. But I thought, you know, since we're uh, uh, studying Hebrews, I thought I'd have some thoughts on Hebrews, uh, what's called the, the third uh, section of it, which is really chapters 3 and 4. Or, well, almost all of 4, but not quite. But anyway, uh, so I'd like to present that. Uh, Christians, that uh, as it speaks of Christians in Hebrews, and if that is those qualified, be called such by their obedience to the uh, last will and testament of Jesus Christ, are all of one brotherhood. Uh, Hebrews 3, verse 1 it says, There, uh, the writer of Hebrews calls them holy brethren because they have obeyed that holy gospel but uh, of course they were in in uh, danger of uh, uh, abandoning the, the that that calling that they had but anyway it's calls them uh, we, we we're really in one brotherhood if we are in fact new testament christians and it doesn't matter if uh, as james says if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings fine apparel and there should, should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, James 2, verse 1. Wealth, wealth, uh, aptitude, uh, skills, learning, social advantage should not divide the body of Christ. The rich man should not despise the poor, nor should the poor envy the rich. But all should endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace Ephesians 4, verse 3. Furthermore, we should all seek each other's good since we are the heirs alike of grace and having our eternal inheritance. It uh, behooves us to think often and sincerely about Christ as the uh, apostle and high priest of our confession. It will serve, among other things, to increase our faith in Christ and our confidence in the perfection and efficacy of the gospel plan of salvation that is through Jesus Christ. It will increase our love towards God as we realize that He so loved us to send His own Son to redeem us, not to mention that that uh, the love that Christ had for us and that he died for us, Romans uh, 5th chapter verse 8 and 1 Timothy 1 verse 15. It will correct and restrain our selfishness and make us more zealous for the glory of God and the salvation of a world lost in sin. It will remind us of Paul's words recorded in Titus the second chapter, verses 11 through 14, that is, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. As the fortunes of the nation of Israel depended on the, upon the uh, faithfulness of Moses, in like manner much of the health of the spiritual nation, that, that is the church, depends on the fidelity of God's ministers today. If the servants of Christ all acted according to the example of Moses, by observing faithfully the fuller and more encouraging instructions of the Holy Spirit that are given to us in the New Testament, the state of the church and the world would be vastly different than it is today. And of course, this was true of long ago and will be true far into the future if the world remains. If this were so, how many more would be Christians today 
and how many of those now eternally lost might be rejoicing among the saints. God still dwells with his people, Hebrews 3rd chapter verse 6. The church is the temple of the living God. We are the temple of the living God, the church. As it is written in 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verse 16, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Why then do we not draw nigh to him who has come so very near to us? Why not, like Enoch and Moses, walk with him and see him who is invisible? Why not avoid everything that is offensive in his sight, such as the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life? 1 John 2, chapter, verses 15 through 17. And why not, like Christ, humbly endeavor to do the will of God in all things? Surely this is our highest happiness and our most reasonable service. Fidelity to, to the end of life is essential to finally enjoying the promised great salvation of the faithful. Hebrews 3rd chapter verse 6, and you can also look at uh, verse 14 in Revelation 2.10. The warnings and admonitions given to us by the writer of Hebrews renders fallacious the imaginary doctrines represented by the TULIP acronym it is unequivocally stated in Matthew, the 10th chapter, the last part of that verse 22, he who endures to the end will be saved. Conversely, he who does not endure to the end will not be saved. Without this endurance on our part, through the abounding grace of God, nothing can save those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Second Thessalonians, first chapter, verses 3 through 10. It is not enough that God has sent his Son into the world to save it, and that Christ has sent the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. John 16, verse 8. It is not enough that we have confessed Christ as the Son of God and our Savior, and that we have done, had our sins washed away in His blood. We must also continue patiently in doing good, seeking after glory, honor, and immortality if we would enjoy eternal life, Romans 2, verse 7. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, chapter, verse 12, for we, if we sin willfully after we have received, uh, I'm sorry, that's uh, Hebrews 10, 26. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. And that's what the Hebrew Christians were in danger of doing. And it says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed uh, lest he falls. No one then should trivialize the commands of God and the urgings of an enlightened conscience. No, not even for a moment. Today, if you will hear his voice, it says in Hebrews 3rd chapter, verse 7, when it says today, that it is an urgent matter. When it says, exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, Hebrews 3rd chapter, verse 13. All unnecessary delay is dangerous because it is sinful and serves to harden the hearts of those who yield to its seductive and deceitful influence. Thus the law of the kingdom of heaven is to hear, to believe, to repent, to confess Christ as the Son of God, and to wash away your sins by the blood of Christ in baptism. It is simply a matter of obeying from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered by the gospel, Romans 6, chapter, verses 17. The primitive Christians did so, and like the Ethiopian eunuch, went on their way rejoicing. 
And we can do the same. But the deceitfulness of sin is very great. Hebrews, the third chapter, verse 13. Those in its grasp are slaves to its influence. Romans 6, uh, 7, and 17, 20, and so on, and some other places. And even the Christian, enlightened and devoted though he may be, has need to be constantly on his guard, lest he too be ensnared and hardened through sin's deceitfulness. 1 Corinthians 9, chapter, verse 27. This, is, this it is important and necessary that we be daily exhorted and encouraged as the scripture implores. Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sins. Why then are we so neglectful of the trust with God, uh, which God has committed to us in this particular, that is exhorting one another? Why do we not exhort one another daily? Why are we so prone to talk about anything and everything rather than about the one thing needed? When we meet our brethren, we are not neglectful to ask about their welfare. We may ask about their prosperity, health, family, and so on. But how often do we inquire about their spiritual state and condition? How many mutual inquiries are made about our spiritual trials, tribulations, and triumphs? Or how may we help uh, another along the way of our journey to reach that heavenly rest of which the writer of Hebrew speaks? Are we in the habit of speaking of secular matters but not of God, of Christ, or of heaven? Now, I know that you in the business world have found this to be true, but in my business career, as a matter of uh, corporate decorum, one did not talk about politics, religion, you didn't tell your colleague that his wife's ugly, you, you didn't do any of that stuff. You just talked about, um, well, personal uh, banalities. That sort of public sentiment was a great barrier to religious conversation. But, you know, there were other ways to engage in religious discourse uh, without giving offense by simply stating what the Bible says about any particular matter, and of course those matters will come up. And you never speak a disparaging thing about a colleague, uh, uh, about their views, or you know whatever they may offer as a rebuttal if, it, if there is one. But outside the corporate or business world, uh, primarily social constraints exist. Of course, Christ is our example. And he never cast pearls before swine. And in some cases, he refrained, uh, refrained from working miracles on account of the extreme wickedness and infidelity of the people. Matthew uh, 13, 58 and Mark 6, 5 through 6. Yet still, the focus of his conversation, wherever he went, was on the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Matthew 6, verse 33. We should first and foremost seek the same. Our greatest want has always been a want of faith in God and in the word of his grace. Hebrews 3rd chapter verses 18 and 19. It was this that first brought sin into the world. Genesis 3 verse 6. It was this that filled the antediluvian world with violence and brought in floodwaters on the ungodly. It was this that caused the, caused the confusion of languages at and eventual dispersion from Babel, Babel. It was this that soon thereafter filled the world with idolatry. It was this that brought down fire and brimstone from heaven on Sodom and Gomorrah and made those cities on the plain a monument to God's hatred of sin. It was this that so often brought down God's judgment on even his own chosen people in the wilderness and in Canaan, and that made their descendants a proverb and a byword in every nation under heaven. It was this that divided the church and filled, filled the dwelling place of the Most High with all manner of Jewish and Gentile abominations. And it is this that now deprives us of a thousand spiritual enjoyments, uh, and that will shut the gates of heaven against millions 
who, like the rebellious Israelites, will seek to enter God's rest when it is too late. Luke, the 13th chapter, verses 24 through 30. No wonder, then, that our blessed Savior often sums up all sin under the heading of unbelief. When speaking of the coming of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me. John 16th chapter, verses 8 and 9. Let us beware lest there be also in any of us an evil heart of unbelief in apostatizing from the living God. The main business of this present life is to labor to enter God's rest, Hebrews 4th chapter, verse 11. Here we are but string pilgrims traveling to the promised land of rest. What folly it is then to anchor our soul in this present life of sandy foundations over which we are passing so very rapidly on our way to that everlasting home of the soul, our spiritual Zion. What folly it is to think like those described by the psalmist in Psalms 49, chapter, verse 11. Their inner thought is that their houses will last forever. Their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Or to lay up treasures here on earth where moth and rust are constantly corroding and corrupting. Matthew 6, chapter, verses 19 through 20. Rather, let us look to the end of our pilgrimage and labors to enter that everlasting rest which is reserved for every faithful child of God. And let us rejoice, as did Paul, that it is better to depart and be with Christ in those heavenly mansions prepared for us, Philippians 1st chapter, verse 23, and John 14, 2. The hypocrite is without hope, and his deceits are vain. He will stand in shame before God, naked and open to the all-penetrating eye of God Almighty. Then every refuge of lies in which he trusted would be swept away, and all the deep, dark, and hidden thoughts and intents of his heart would be made manifest in the light of God's countenance by means of the living and powerful word which pierces through to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verses 11 through 13. May God save us from such an ordeal on the day of his final reckoning. God is long-suffering towards us and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, chapter, verse 9. It is, therefore, up to us. And I want to allow this opportunity for those who would be willing to uh, come to repentance to do so as this time is extended saying, and those who may have uh, been an infidel to Christ and uh, one again wants to return to their first love. And whatever that uh, spiritual need may be, you may address it now as we stand and sing. <laughs>